Hi everyone, welcome to SUNY Poly's Faculty Research Speed Talk event. I'm Krista Thompson, Assistant Dean of Graduate Studies. We're happy to have you here with us today. Today's presentations will be provided by faculty within the College of Nanoscale Science and Engineering. Our first presenter is Professor Kathleen Dunn. Kathy's background is in material science. So mostly I work in uh, the area of material science, which is looking at classes of behavior based on um, collections of properties. So for example, metals are all conductive and ductile, whereas ceramics are brittle and typically um, you know, transparent and uh, not terribly shock resistant. And in particular, the defects in those materials often um, dominates over their um, in, intrinsic behavior. So I study defect structures and how they dominate behavior and whether we can manipulate that. So I'm just going to show you a couple examples from my group um, that on the left uh, you see here this uh, image where there's the speckle contrast is showing grains in a copper film. They're all different orientations except for these a few large domains and if we do diffraction mapping we can see that those orientations um, the green ones that are the large grains all share the same orientation. That tells us something about how that film is transforming in response to stress. We can also look at interfaces between, uh, here in this image is a cobalt layer on a cal uh, copper layer and look at the interface between them and how they are diffusing together as a function of the defects at that level. And if you go even deeper, into um, atomic level imaging, you can actually see these uh, boundaries as where these arrays of dots, those dots are actually atoms in copper. You can see where that array changes direction, that's called a grain boundary. And if we introduce some other metal like bismuth, that's those bright dots along that boundary. And it actually changes the bonding across that boundary. So for example, if we model how the electron density is changing around the bismuth, uh, it's actually stealing about 0.6 of a, an electron from each of the copper atoms at that boundary, which means that the copper no longer acts like a metal. It starts to be very directional bonding and very brittle as a result. And that's actually um, where a bismuth Piece, or a copper piece that's been doped with bismuth would break is right at that boundary. So it has a lot of implications for the properties of the metals and what you can and can't make with them if it's going to um, break um, at these locations. Um, but defects aren't always a bad thing. So um, in a ceramic, for example, we can manipulate the defect structure for um, to get properties that we want. So for example, our um, nanoparticles that we are using to polish wafers or polish metal structures um, depends on the, the effectiveness of that depends on the oxygen vacancies at the surface of the nanoparticle. So we can manipulate that um, by changing um, the rest of the slurry environment, whether that's pH or particle size or um, adding uh, hydrogen peroxide, for example, and watch how we change that to manipulate the removal rate or the polishing efficiency of the Syria nanoparticles. And actually, we just um, submitted a patent this year on this, uh, which was my first foray into patent um, writing. And it was very exciting for the student as well for his thesis project to be able to result in a patent in additional to papers. On the right, you see another kind of, of ceramic nanoparticle. These are made out of silicon oxide. The top picture is just the electron microscope image. So you see these clusters of little spherical particles. The lower one is mapped by um, the elemental distribution. So there's a silicon oxide core surrounded by a carbonaceous matrix that might um, affect the uptake and impact on biological tissues, say for worker health. So in the, this way, so sometimes we can manipulate those defects, sometimes we can uh, have to engineer around them. So I'm looking at some other composites as well. So these are particles that we are, are 
structures that we're making in the microscope by bleeding in a little bit of gas. And we use that electron beam to break it down. And since we can scan the beam, we can make arbitrary shapes like these little egg crates. Um, and if we zoom into those egg crates, we find that there's nanoparticles in a carbonaceous matrix, and then we can manipulate both the size of the particles. So these is a series of images showing the particles getting larger and the diffraction patterns getting crisper, indicating um, enhancing the particle size, or we can manipulate the carbonaceous matrix. So for example, make it um, less conductive and uh, harder by uh, manipulating the bonding ratio from sp2, which is graphite-like, to sp3-like, which is more diamond-like. Um, and we do a lot of electron microscopy and spectroscopy um, to confirm those outcomes. And then the last project I wanted to tell you about is looking at uh, nickel ferrite particles that form, uh, they form naturally as a corrosion product in steel water flow systems, uh, and they tend to collect in unfortunate locations um, and cause abrasion and wear of those parts. But we can't really study them in their natural environment. They tend to be in difficult to get at places. So we're making them in our lab with a fairly standard um, hydrothermal reactor on loan from another professor who you're going to hear talk a little bit later today. Uh, and we are looking for the size of the particles and their shape because that will control how they agglomerate and uh, collect and impede flow in their real system. So on the right, you see some uh, micrographs that show some little hexagonal particles versus little octagons that grow. And down here, we have some X-ray diffraction to prove that we're really making what we wanted to make. And so just to summarize, these are the folks that did the work. Um, I didn't cite them on each of their pages, but I thought they should at least get uh, some mention. And then down at the bottom is where my graduates have gone. They are typically going into the semiconductor industry or the undergrads, uh, a fair number of them are going into um, graduate schools. So uh, just so you get a sense of the, the relationships that my group has formed and where those students uh, end up as a result. Thank you. So I'm Nate Cady. Can you see my slide okay? Okay, that's me with a circle and this is my research group. Um, so my group consists of uh, both undergraduate and graduate students and we do a variety of things in my lab. We uh, study um, ways that nanotechnology can be used to understand biology and by that I mean we make lots of devices and tools to, to basically do measurements. So we make microfluidic devices, we work with systems that can pattern uh, both cells and proteins and nucleic acids onto surfaces and so the uh, top picture here is uh, showing, I'm trying to get a pointer actually, um, is showing uh, where we've printed our logo CNSE uh, with bacterial cells. Um, we also work on biosensors uh, to measure uh, basically a variety of different targets and I have a slide I'll show you on that in a minute. We also use nanotech to enable uh, biological applications, so very applied uh, nanotechnology for biology and those are the middle row of images that I'm showing on my screen and so that includes uh, therapeutics and things for tissue engineering as well as uh, modifying surfaces to make them uh, more or less uh, um, amenable to cells, uh, including bacteria and mammalian cells, to grab onto those surfaces. So that's you see all those little green dots are bacteria stuck to different surfaces with uh, different topography on them. And the bottom panel of images is describing work that we do uh, that I like to call biomimicry. So we basically take inspiration from biology and we try to develop either electrical or mechanical nanotechnologies that mimic those biological functions. And so the next couple of slides, I'll just show you some quick examples of that work in a little more detail. So we've been actively working on developing uh, biological sensors for a variety of different diseases. So the, this work started looking for something, um, a bacteria that causes Lyme disease. And what we actually do is we measure uh, antibodies that people generate against this bacteria when they're infected. So it's something called serology. And we do this with a really cool technology uh, called surface plasmon resonance. And the little gold chip on the bottom right of my slide is showing one of the chips that we both fabricate in our nanofabrication facilities at SUNY Poly, 
but we also use in-house to do assay development. And so all those little spots are actually spots of protein uh, from the bacteria we're trying to detect. And the little uh, yellow and red uh, note in the bottom right says that we're actually transitioning this right now from detection of a patient's response to uh, bacterial infection to looking for viral infection um, with corona, the new novel coronavirus, uh, COVID-19. And we actually have some preliminary results now showing that we can actually detect uh, serum antibodies against this virus uh, from patients. Another thing that we do is we do uh, integration of uh, microfluidic devices with uh, either tissue or animals. And this is in collaboration with some medical researchers. And so my group makes these devices that are essentially a window that create a portal to image the inside of an animal while the animal is still alive. And we can also deliver fluid reagents uh, to that animal, uh, to the interior, uh, to be able to affect things that are going on. So the images in the bottom are showing uh, both real images and then simulations of doing fluid delivery. Uh, and the main idea for this project is to be able to give drugs or labels uh, to tumors inside of an animal and understand some of the mechanisms of what's going on um, within those tumors and within the, the, the cells that are actually escaping from those tumors. And the last thing I'll show you is work uh, in the biomimicry theme. And here we leverage the nanofabrication capabilities at SUNY Poly to build um, these really cool devices called memristors. So this is a memory resistor, and it essentially is a, a tunable uh, resistor that we integrate with normal transistor-based CMOS, uh, so normal computer chips. And th these devices act like a synapse in the brain. So basically they can encode information like synapses in our brain encode information, and they can be used for both neuromorphic and AI applications. I think that's the end of my slides. Um, really quick overview of what we do, but we really, um, the take home point is we combine uh, nanotechnology and biology and try to do a mashup of all kinds of interesting thing uh, underneath those themes. Thanks. Yeah, so I'm Professor Palu and my laboratory uh, is focused on a lot of different biomedical questions and really across scales. So working down to the nanoscale in terms of um, biological mechanisms and the proteins that are involved, but also up to the scale of how can we use this in, in human regenerative therapy. And so what you see in the summary slide is really just an idea of all the um, all the different types of aspects that are important, even if you want to do uh, regenerative medicine in a particular area. So the main focus in regenerative medicine is working with human stem cells. You see that in the bottom left hand corner. And we're able to really combine that with nanotechnology applications. You see some um, examples in the top right corner in terms of what are the types of polymers that we use, what are the um, sorts of 3D uh, structures that we're able to enable by using um, photolithography generated platforms, and what about microfluidics and then uh, neural ribbons. And so in the area of regenerative medicine, we're interested in um, a lot of neurodegenerative diseases, so Alzheimer's and aging. Uh, so age-related uh, neural uh, cognitive defects, um, spinal cord injury, um, traumatic brain injury, also arrhythmias working with cardiomyocytes and diabetes, diabetes working in the area of bioprocessing. So we can perform experiments in a variety of ways. So in terms of disease modeling or drug discovery or bioprocessing, in terms of neurodegeneration, I'm going to talk about two projects today. The one that relates to uh, using a uh, a sensor, basically a, a, a complex ELISA to look at signaling between two cells. So how do they talk to each other? So if you have traumatic brain injury, how does that affect how cells talk to each other? And also talk a little bit about spinal cord injury and what we're doing to generate uh, human spinal motor neurons. And the beauty about stem cells is you actually become a developmental biologist. So if you look at this multi-cell analysis, you're going to see that you really need to understand uh, everything about developmental biology to make those particular type of cells. So now we look, if we're looking at cognitive functions and we want to study the brain, are we looking at frontotemporal dementias? Are we looking uh, at different areas of the brain um, in terms of Alzheimer's? Are we looking at the spinal cord um, in which we then have to develop the cells in a slightly different way? And as well, you have to have uh, the correct functional aspects of the cells. And so you have to be able to look at aspects like the electrophysiology 
include bioinformatics, so what genes are being turned on and off, and single cell and multi-cell analysis. So the analysis gets pretty complex. And then we're also um, expanding into really over the last five years into computational neuroscience. And so what that allows you to do is even though we have super resolution microscopy and you can actually look uh, with high resolution inside cells now, you can't always have the, the live visual activity of what's going on with that high resolution aspect. And so what we're doing is we're modeling what's going on um, inside neurons mathematically. And what that allows us to do is make predictions that lead to experiments. We're also applying machine learning to look at images of glioblastomas in the brain. So to be able to predict um, sort of the pathological state of that. We're also working on artificial synapses. So we have some mathematical models and those are gonna start to be incorporated in hardware models. So a variety of applications. And then just two quick examples. This um, is from my student, Nushan Amini and she's a PhD candidate. And what she's doing here is she's using, uh, she's generating neural stem cells on the left. Neural stem cells are a common therapeutic source that, uh, that's used in regenerative medicine, um, spinal cord injury, and even in, uh, in terms of uh, therapy for different types of, of brain injuries. And so what she's able to do is it just shows you that she's generating a platform um, through lithography. And then we're using different techniques to basically tether DNA to beads and then antibodies to the DNAs. And then the cells are on top of an inverted chamber. If you look at the right, you can kind of see. And so the cells are able to talk to each other under different stresses. And then we can look simultaneously at a number of cytokines at once. And so understand the full breadth of the conversation that's going on. And then in terms of spinal cord injury, uh, really the slide outlines mostly um, the types of uh, technologies we have to apply. In the short talk, you really can't cover it too much, but it's developmental biology, stem cell biology, uh, neuroscience, electrophysiology, the different types of matrices, your engineering devices. We're going to be getting into bioelectronics, so how can you monitor um, once you put the cells into a, a rat injury site, um, really the progress of those cells before you have to sacrifice the animals. And so there's a, a diagram chart there. This is my student, Zach. He's an MD, PhD student. So SUNY Poly has a great program with SUNY Downstate in which you can start your medical degree down there, come up here and do your PhD work and then go back down and finish. And so then you're really a research physiologist, which is important. So we show you some electrophysiology images here and imaging to get at the, um, the upper part of the spinal cord. So, I think I will stop there and just let you know that again, uh, what we're interested in is uh, really getting applications either into the clinic as quickly as we can or into devices as quickly as we can. Thank you. Thank you. So I'm Scott Tenenbaum. I'm with the NanoBio Group. I work on RNA, specifically something called SXRNA. So hopefully, or maybe not hopefully, you know that RNA along with DNA and protein are the three main building blocks of life. I think RNA is the most important. Um, it plays an intermediary role going from DNA to protein, but it also does a lot of other cool things, usually as a result of its structure. So RNA forms structure at the nanoscale. A lot of the structures are in the five to 20 nanometer range. And what we specifically try and do is design RNAs to form structures that we have engineered as a result of two pieces of RNA coming together. So we make the piece that's depicted in this picture in green. We call that the bait RNA. So we informatically design that. And when it interacts, and you can see it's, it's non-structured here, but when it interacts with what we call a trigger RNA, which is coming from a cell of interest, we get something that forms a complex or a, st a structure of interest for us. And like I mentioned, these typically are in the seven to 15 nanometer size nanostructures. And it's a switch that is going from an off form to an on form as a result of the presence of something coming from the cell. So it's a, a analogous to an RNA-based transistor that we can control the state of whether it's on or off depending on the presence or absence of this trigger RNA. So we can use that to do work. We can take this entire structurally interacting RNA or SXRNA for short, and we can 
link it to a gene or an open reading frame of interest and use that to control the expression of a protein. Either the protein isn't made when the switch is off or a bunch of the protein is made when the switch is on. So we can use that to do work in a cell to repair a damaged gene or to express a suicide gene if we wanted to use this as a therapeutic. Uh, and so we're developing this for different approaches, including antivirals, uh, specifically for COVID. Uh, we also can use this uh, in devices like point of care devices or di um, diagnostics. And so we can either uh, use it to express something and uh, that we can detect or we can detect the RNA itself. So this figure demonstrates how uh, we can use RNA to create a structure that captures a fluorescent molecule. So these are our two pieces. This is the piece we make. So this is our bait RNA. This is the trigger RNA, which is a piece of RNA found in liver cells in this case, uh, as opposed to other types of cells. And when these two pieces come together, they make this new structure that we've actually predicted. So here in green is this molecule right here. And you can see it pulls these purple sequences which were here and here over. And when it does that, it creates the binding site for a little fluorescent molecule called DFHBI. And it binds here, that's a little molecule right there, and it now will glow green. So here's an example of it working. This, these are liver cells, they glow green, and kidney cells don't. So, and we can use the same concept in a, a diagnostic. So that's essentially what we work on, uh, RNA, everything and anything RNA as nano switches. That's it for me. Hello everyone, uh, my name is Vincent Labella. I'm a faculty member in the College of Nanoscale Science and Engineering at SUNY Polytechnic Institute. I'm gonna give an overview of the research my group does um, at the college. Um, the research uh, talk is entitled Visualization of Electrostatic Barriers uh, with Nanoscale Resolution. Uh, and this work is done with the, in uh, conjunction with a group of hardworking uh, graduate students and undergraduate students, as well as some industrial collaborators, uh, Steve at Consiglio at Tel. Um, and what you're looking at here is a, a map of the electrostatic barrier that forms between a metal and semiconductor. Um, and there's the energy here is the energy at which an electron needs, a carrier needs to uh, have to make it over the barrier. And this is resolved spatially over a square micron. Uh, what's in the middle here is a histogram of those energies, just showing the number of counts at a given energy. And then over on the right here is some recent results we got uh, for a metal insulator semiconductor uh, structure for some ultra-thin HFO. And, um, the HFO is courtesy of uh, Tokyo Electron. And here's some just two recent publications that have come out over the past couple of years um, kind of describing the results here. So if you're interested, you could look these up as well as look at our research group website or, or email me as well. So um, barriers between materials are important uh, in nanoelectronic devices. Uh, these devices are formed by putting different types of materials, metals, insulators, and semiconductors next to each other to form things like diodes and transistors and capacitors and all that, all that um, fun solid state um, device electronic stuff. And what that does is it creates barriers. It creates electrostatic barriers. Um, between the different regions, so metal and a semiconductor, or metal and insulator and semiconductor, um, and those barriers then, we can alter those barriers to um, control the flow of charge carriers, which allows us to do uh, logic and transistors and, and diodes and things like that. So um, when you make devices, you're really interested in performance. Um, that's what the industry is interested in. And when you want to know your performance of your device, we just run your, your device, you just measure IV or CV. Uh, and uh, we know that uh, when you start making a device, you start with a set of materials, uh, you form a structure, and that dictates your stoichiometry, uh, which gives uh, determines the electrostatics at that interface, which ultimately determines the performance. So we kind of start up, and you know, um, there's many techniques out there that can measure these different things, materials, there's deposition technique, structure, uh, uh, microscopy, stoichiometry, there's different techniques. And performance, again, IB and CV, but electrostatics is very difficult to measure, and that's where uh, the technique we use comes in. It's called beam ballistic electron emission microscopy, and it's based on STM. Um, and it, what it's able to do is measure the interface here, the electrostatic barrier at the interface between the metal and semiconductor or metal insulator 
and semiconductor. And so our research group is focused on understanding the complex relationship between the interface electrostatics and the structure on the nanometer length scale. So as these devices shrink, the contact areas like between the source and drain, uh, front end contacts these days are on the order of 30 or 40 nanometers square or, or even smaller. They're getting smaller with every generation. So you need to know what, how that fluctuates on the nano scale. Um, okay, so STM is a, a scanning probe techniques um, where you take a very sharp tip, uh, get it next to a sample, and electrons uh, quantum mechanically tunnel from the tip into the sample. Um, that tunneling is exponentially sensitive to the separation distance as well as the energy, and you have a feedback loop uh, that monitors the height. You set a set point, and then you just raster the tip over the surface, and you say maintain a constant surface, uh, I'm sorry, a constant current, and modulate the Z and you measure Z. And what you get, if everything's really good, your tip's clean, your surface is clean, um, you get atoms, like here, the silicon 111 or the gallium arsenide 001. Or for a metal semiconductor, you'll just see the balling up of the metal on the semiconductor. Um, okay, so beam uh, is a th what's called a three terminal technique. It uses STM, but it adds a third terminal to the back. And you do this on a metal semiconductor, or you can do a metal insulator semiconductor structure as well. Um, here you have an ohmic contact, a front contact to the metal, and here you would have, say, a shocky barrier, like I'm describing right here in this figure. Uh, and with beam, you can do imaging. The STM, you also get the beam image, which is like a negative. Uh, thicker regions of metal, you get less current. Uh, and again, it's sensitive to the tip bias or the electron and the hot carrier energy here. Um, and again, if you're below the barrier, you don't get any current above you get transmission so that's imaging you can also do spectroscopy where you sit at one point and you average a bunch of spectra together you just ramp the bias up and you average them together and you can fit it to what's known as the bell and kaiser model uh, to get the barrier height so it's a very accurate measure of the shocky barrier height so our group uh, goes one step further where we actually do spectra mapping so we'll take 10 to 100 thousands of spectra on a grid over a surface uh, to extract the barrier height um, and then provide a map of that. So typically we'll take a grid, uh, we'll step it every, say one to five to 10 nanometers over a desired area. We can average all those spectra into one spectra, fit it and get the barrier height, or we can go back and uh, fit each one and then plot a map. So here's a map of those thresholds here. You see some slight fluctuations here. We get a map, this is over a square. Micron, micron by micron region. Uh, this particular one was a 10 nanometer spatial resolution. We have about a 10 MeV energetic resolution. Here is the nice narrow distribution of thresholds. Um, so that's for gold on silicon. We get this nice interface. Um, and again, what you get out of that, um, again, this is gold on silicon as well as you can see defects, right? So you see some localized defects here, either high spots or low spots, or the barrier might be higher. And this could be due to a whole host of things. It could be localized defects at the interface or in the metal or in a semiconductor causing some type of scattering event, or could just be some type of elastic scattering event um, here. And you can also look at what we call the slope, which is this A factor. This can correlate to um, two different changes in this barrier. Right? So again, this, this map here is a map of this phi B. And this here is a map of this A. Okay, so just give you an overview of some of the things we see. Here's gold on silicon, nice and uniform. Here's an interesting one where we did a partially reacted tungsten silicide with a gold cap. And you see we have a lot of variation, which is very interesting here. Here's a mixed uh, metal semiconductor system, uh, gold, silver. Those two metals are completely miscible. And the nice thing about them is that they're uh, Shocky barriers are about 20 or 200 MeV apart, so they're very wide apart, so we can resolve those differences. Now, if we look at these in the histogram form, what we see is a uh, very narrow one for the pure gold. In the mixed interface here, the partially reacted silicide, uh, we see a very broad distribution. And again, for the mixed gold, silver, we see another broad distribution, maybe with the shoulder. So what we were focused on is trying to understand what is this telling us? Um, these energies are indications of the chemistry, right? The barrier uh, at that interface. And so we've developed a model, just a computational model that simulates um, the electrons moving through the metal, the kinetic Monte Carlo, and allows us to kind of specify the barrier um, and it just simulates the transport of electrons through that interface. Um, it's sort of a, a brute force search, so we just have a chi-squared minimization routine that, um, where we just have a bunch of input parameters and ranges. We put in our data set and it just searches and it just, just searches over all these ranges for the best fit. And here we're seeing um, a chi-square to two, and this one is for the 
tungsten, yeah, this is the tungsten silicide one. Here's a, what we're seeing here, what it's telling us is that we have two kind of peaks here, two barriers, plus a third here. So uh, this would be when tungsten, you put tungsten on silicon, uh, if it's unreacted, it'll have a lower barrier height. When it reacts, it'll form a silicide. So we're seeing both components here, 0.66 to 0.74. So this would be tungsten, tungsten silicide. And here we're seeing about 0.84 come through and that's from the gold cap. So we actually have to cap these with gold to prevent oxidation. And so the, the non-uniformity of the tungsten silicide, this was deposited by E-beam, allowed some, maybe some um, areas for the gold to come through. Again, we, what we do is we deposit all this in UHV and then put the gold cap down. So the tungsten silicide was partially reacted and then after we put the gold down, we got a mixture of the two. So again, this would all be missed. All this interesting detail is missed if you're just averaging a spectra or if you're just doing IV. And so that's kind of the insight we get out of that. And so um, just in summary, um, we do a lot more. Again, we do it with um, insulators and dielectrics as well. Um, those recent publications you can find on our group's website. Um, here's the group of students, um, some who graduated and gone on, Jack's uh, getting ready to finish up. Here's the, the, uh, the equipment, Omicron, low temperature STM. We have a chamber here to do depositions. Um, it's connected to an, a 3.5 MBE for other depositions as well. This is the typical sample size. Again, a schematic of our both our sample holder uh, and some of the requirements for Beam. So that's it for my talk. Um, if you're interested, please email me with further questions or go to our group's website for more uh, information. Thank you. So my name is Shadi Shahidi Pursanbek. I'm a professor of um, nanoengineering here at SUNY Poly. And I have asked, thank you, Krista, to share my, uh, my slides. So I, um, Krista, can you go? Thank you. All right, awesome. So my, uh, my research program is mainly focused on um, ultra wide band gap and wide band gap um, semiconductor materials and, and devices based on these materials. This is um, just a snapshot of my, uh, my, my students in the past, uh, my goodness, about five, six years. Some of them, they have already graduated and they are working anywhere from, you can kind of on the lower hand, uh, lower um, well, actually on the right, you see the, one of the images that you see pictures, one of my student uh, that's in the middle now works actually on, in Wall Street for a bank. So it's really interesting and he's doing data analytics for that all the way to working in the energy sector and um, doing um, uh, one, uh, one is on one of our undergrads that now it's uh, doing his PhD and on the right, or I'm sorry, on the left are some of my current students, not all of them, but some of them. So next slide, please. So I have tried to capture, we do a, a lot of things uh, in my group. I've, I've tried to capture a couple of examples so that I can go a bit in detail and explain to you some of the things that we do. Uh, we basically go all the way from uh, designing the type of device that we want to create based on the type of functionality that the material provides to us, all the way to the growth uh, and deposition of the material using um, a deposition method called Mitchell Organic Chemical Vapor Deposition or MOCVD for short um, to characterization, on wafer characterization uh, to device fabrication and device measurement. And sometimes we collaborate with others to um, integrate them into devices, into systems. Um, so here are some of the examples that I have provided to you of some of the active research that we have going on is in using three nitride um, semiconductors for application in power electronics, um, creating uh, devices such as MOS hemped high electromobility transistors and metal oxide hemped devices to provide to in integrating them into stretchable um, device applications. Um, so what you see on the um, upper uh, right um, is the, is the R on, the on resistance of these power electronic devices as a function of the breakdown voltage they provides to you. And to kind of put it in context is as you, um, for example, for electrical vehicle or for power grid, you need to create switches that they can handle higher and higher and higher voltages. And obviously most uh, in the market, what we currently have are based on silicon MOSFETs. Um, and as the voltage requirement goes higher, 
silicon cannot really handle it anymore just because of its small band gap. It creates very high um, heat at those type of um, power applications. So uh, there is a need, uh, there's an equation that they have not included here that really the power handling of a switch goes based on its band gap. That's a very important factor in it because it's the electric field they can handle. And you can see that going from silicon to silicon carbide, which is another wide band gap material, is an indirect wide band gap to gallium nitride, you can reduce the RN resistance, which is really important as you go to gallium nitride. And what it provides to you is this uh, being able to handle much higher voltages because of the because of its wide band gap. Um, but also you can make the device much smaller because now you can handle much higher voltages. Uh, so that allows you to um, create the entire system that's much smaller and be able to kind of implement it in, into, let's say, power grid or electric vehicles or uh, or electric ship or all sort of type of applications. So that's the application that drives, um, let's say, the project or the technology. From there, uh, one, uh, one device that is used in that type of switch application is the high electron mobility transistor. And what I have for you on, um, is on the, on, the, uh, on the right, you see just the layer structure from silicon substrate all the way to creating the hemp itself. And the hemp itself is really just a gallium nitride, which is on the top, gallium nitride. On top of it, you have aluminum gallium nitride, very thin layer, and then it's capped. The rest of it that's under it, it's really stress engineering because you, you're putting together these layers that they are pretty highly lattice mismatched. And what happens if you, if, you, if you put lattice mismatch materials on top of each other, um, kind of think about that you have these two atoms and then you put something on top of it that's much larger or much smaller, as you make it thicker and thicker, it basically creates cracks or it creates a lot of stress in it. So the rest of it is kind of doing, excuse me, stress engineering. One really interesting thing that we can do is in situ monitor, monitor the device as it grows. So we can monitor the stress that's being built up. So what you see in the middle of the slide is um, stress evolution as a function of thickness. So we can monitor that as we put the first layer and then we put the second layer and then we put the third layer, how the stress is evolving. So we can in situ manipulate how the thickness of these layers and also the composition of these layers to achieve the type of stress that we require. Some devices you actually would want to have internal stress in them. So this allows us to have kind of eyes in the system as the, as the systems, as the device structure is growing. Um, so just a little bit about high, this high electron mobility transistor and why this is so important in gallium nitride. Gallium nitride, is a polar material, which means that if you grow it in along its C direction, um, it's, it's, it has polarization. If you put, so it, it, it has polarity in it anyway. But if you put another layer that compositionally is different from it, let's say aluminum gallium nitride on top of it, now you're putting two polar material on top of each other, that their polarization is different from each other. Now what happens is that now at the interface, you're going to have um, something that another polarization that's called um, piezoelectric polarization. That piezoelectric polarization, I don't know what happened I had actually that um, little, little schematic here, but that um, piezoelectric polarization allows creation of a triangular quantum well at the interface between these two. And that creates a very high density of electrons right at the interface between aluminum gallium nitride and gallium nitride, the channel and the barrier. Suddenly, without even doing any doping, you have very high concentration of mobile carriers. And that's really the beauty of high electron mobility transistor in three nitrides. That, and as you may know, is that if you don't put dopants in there, you're by definition you're reducing the amount of scattering. So now you can actually have a pretty high frequency device that it's not, uh, that uh, you don't have to be sensitive to how much doping you put in there. So two example, another example that I have put here for you is um, we take hemp for power electronic application, but also for biological application. You heard from Professor Katie at the beginning uh, with his group, with another faculty in our bioscience group, we have been using 
um, our high electromobility transistor to test for um, hydrogen peroxide. And there in the bottom uh, left-hand corner, you see the sensitivity. It's basically the current that we are detecting from the device as a function of time and how its sensitivity changes as time uh, moves on. Uh, next slide, please, Krista. Thank you. Um, here I'm giving you another, uh, another application of these ultra wide band gap and wide, uh, wide band gap material, and that's in detection devices. Um, there are lots of examples. We work on uh, avalanche photo detectors, photocathode detectors, but um, ultimately we want to use both of them for single photon detection. A photocathode, which is the example here, um, this is a project that we, are, we have been doing um, with um, Jet Propulsion Lab for NASA application for astronomy. And a photocathode is really a piece of what goes into a system of detection. So you can kind of just see um, how uh, the, the photon comes in and then you have the whole scintillator and then you have the photocathode and the rest of it, the rest of the multiplication of that um, detected photon. So we are working on that photocathode that goes right there. A photocathode is really, uh, if you look at the band diagram that I have, on the middle of the page, um, you see that photocathodes currently are made by putting a layer, a thin layer, almost like a, less than even a mono layer of cesium at the surface of these compound semiconductors. And the reason is a photocathode is a, um, is a hot electron device, which means you need to pull that, uh, pull the electron, the photon comes in, the electron is excited into the valence band and you want to detect that right away. You don't want it to thermalize or any of it. Um, so just going through it quickly, we have been able to um, create a photocathode that does not require cesium because cesium is very chemically active. So uh, the band diagram shows you that we've been able by doing band engineering in the three nitrides to create a system that the conduction band falls below the vacuum level at the surface. So the, the created electron by photon absorption can be extracted um, out of the system. Um, just another 30 seconds and in, in the bottom, kind of taking it from application and the device side, but also into how important it is to, to study the material itself. Doping is a very important piece of, let's say a photocathode for its absorbing layer. So here I'm showing that in collaboration with one of our um, collaborators at, um, at another university, we've been uh, looking into how dopants, magnesium dopants, as it goes into the gallium nitride for this application, uh, depending on which polarity it goes in, it can be segregated or it can be uniformly distributed. And by the way, if, in case I didn't mention, these are atom probe tomography uh, images that I'm showing there. So I'll stop here. We're just wrapping up and mentioning that uh, we do, we basically, what we want to do in my research group is take um, advantage of the functionalities that the material provides to us and create devices, electronic or optoelectronic, or a combination of the two that can, um, that can give us a higher functionality or a higher performing device. So I'll, I'll leave it at that. And if you have any question, please feel free to email me. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> okay, can you see my screen now? Yes, I can. Great. Hi, I'm Greg Denbo. I'm a faculty in nanoengineering. And oh, we're nice going to be really quick here, but the work we do focuses on industrial applications for semiconductor manufacturing. The current leading effort we're working on is on EUV, extreme ultraviolet, because that's the latest technology that the leading semiconductor manufacturers are using to make the devices that are very shortly can go into our phones. And the news yesterday was Samsung just shipped their first million units of DRAM using this technology that we've been helping with. And the EUV technology uses a high energy photon, short wavelength, you can get better resolution, but that complicates the interactions of the lithography process with the materials, the photoresist used for the lithography because the primary photon doesn't do the chemistry. The photon generates electrons, the electrons have some cascade, and the low energy electrons do the chemistry and we're studying those interactions. 
a lot of the experiments in our lab are things that mostly we build tools to solve the problems. So the bottom two pictures are tools that were designed and built in our lab by undergraduates and graduate students. So when we find an industrial, industrially relevant problem that needs to be solved, we look for how we can solve it. And often that involves building custom tools to make custom measurements. In this case for semiconductor manufacturing and EUV lithography, it's measuring the photon and electron interactions in these photoresists. So we can expose EUV photons or directly with, EUV, with electrons and measure the reactions of the photoresist. Of interest then is how far these electrons travel. So if a photon gets absorbed, it generates an electron, it travels causing chemistry. The farther that distance is, the more the resolution is lost in this lithography process. So we study those, those effects and the simple version is shown on the top picture, which is that we can just start by shooting 80 EV electrons at the sample. The photoresist responds to electrons. We can see how deep in the photoresist those electrons are being exposed, which is causing the photoresist to, to, photoresist to dissolve in the developer. And we can measure the range of these electrons and infer how far these electrons are traveling in the lithography process. We're also very interested in what energy is being used because the original photon generates an electron. The electron loses energy along the way. In the end, it's the low energy electrons that are causing the chemistry, but we can study this directly by using low energy electrons and counting the number of reactions that occur in the photoresist by an outgassing product to a quadrupole mass spectrometer or other couple other techniques. So we can look at what happens to a 5 EV electron, what happens to a 10 EV electron, how far do they travel, how many reactions occur, and help understand exactly what's going on in these materials or the semiconductor industry, which is both the Samsung and others who are going to use the EUV lithography technology, but also the photoresist suppliers who are going to provide the materials used by those manufacturers. We do a variety of different topic areas. Another big one right now for us is nanoparticles and nanoparticle detection. The primary focus here is for detecting, detecting nanoparticles in semiconductor processing tools because if you have a wafer and a particle lands there, that's going to be a defect and that device might fail. If a particle lands on the mask, which then prints on the wafer over and over again, then all the devices are going to fail. So understanding where nanoparticles are within these tools and reducing the number of nanoparticles that, that fall on critical areas, that's important for the industry. But finding nanoparticles is tricky because the smaller the particle, the smaller the light scattering. It actually scales as the sixth power of the diameter, so 10 times smaller particle has one millionth as much light scattered from it, so it becomes a really hard job to find the nanoparticles. We have a variety of different techniques we apply to help the industry understand where the nanoparticles are coming from, where, what surfaces they bounce from, and what finally happens when they land on the surfaces of interest. So I moved quickly because we're already over time. Um, and now I think it's up to Krista to continue here. Thanks, Greg. Thank so um, thanks again to all of our faculty presenters. Um, I, I noticed that uh, Mukhtar also joined us, so welcome. Um, do you want to introduce yourself to the faculty? Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, I'm Mukhtar Ahmed, so thank you. I joined very late, so unfortunately, I didn't listen uh, most of the presentation, so at the last I listened. Um, my name is Mukhtar Ahmed. Uh, last year, I was supposed to join Sony Poly, but because of visa problem, um, I couldn't join. So currently, I'm here in Italy. Uh, I joined a PhD program here, but uh, I'm interested to join Sony Poly uh, for the fall semester. Uh, now I'm more interested to work on um, biosensors and currently my project is uh, to integrate biosensor into RFID. So I would be happy to find a very close area, uh, research project close to biosensors um, at Sunny Poly. Great, thank you. Um, we are, are hoping to have this um, emailed to you, the, today's presentation. So, um, so even though you were late, you, you didn't miss out. So, um, okay, so stay you. tuned. 